All right, thank you. Hey, uh, just out of curiosity, who has, is familiar with behavior-driven development? All right, cool. All right, so we, we actually have tried to balance this presentation between it because there's just so much that we can actually go into when we talk about behavior-driven development. And we only have 30 minutes, so hopefully we have everything that you're looking for. So, my name is Aaron, and this is Zachary, and we're actually from FIS Global. Um, our specific division is the mobile data and analytics group, where we actually process mobile financial transactions. We're actually one of the largest financial technology companies in the world, and our customers are actually the banks and credit unions. Now, this, it may, our mobile client application is actually pretty predominantly, it's about 80% it's about in the market, so I would be very, it's probably very, it, you could, might actually be running our mobile client on your actual phone. Um, our actual ecosystems are actually built around that core banking product, and when we actually started going into using Apache Spark, we actually had one predominant use case around the number of transactions that we're getting, which was this morning, it, it made me very happy to hear Matei say that data warehouse was one thing that they're focusing on, because it was ETL, and at the time we imp and started implementing our ETL use case, it really wasn't something being done on Spark. So we had our opportunity to, to look at our project anew and to look at how we could take Apache Spark and treat it as a greenfield element incorpor incorporating it into our project. So the last presentation here was, actually, uh, was a very enlightening session about ETL. And ETL is still very much a thing. I used the word up there, data wrangling, because for a while, everywhere you read, it was ETL is really you know, we can do it without ETL, it's not really around, it's going away. But I think really the truth, of the truth is just the way we do it, when we do it, and why we do it, that's the only thing that has really changed around ETL. So long as we don't, so long as we're an end consumer of the data, like for example, a mobile client is producing the data for us and then we have to process it, until we actually have full control of that pipeline, we're always gonna be doing some sort of transformation to make things agree together. So that was actually our use case for, for why we did this. When we, since we already had an existing process for ETL that was running quite a bit slower, we were already familiar with these types of questions. We're already being asked these types of questions. Like, can you actually prove that the data transforming correctly was very often. Can you prove it? Can you test it? And because our processes were actually in the slow end, we you often, in that case, you, you try to opt for the balance of time for how you develop it. Is our testing really understandable? Were we actually doing a lot of the complete unit tests? And were, were we covering all the scenarios that we actually wanted to put inside the ETL framework? What is acceptance criteria? This was very often a question where you actually had to sit with your product owner or the product person and try to convince them or educate them about why the code actually is doing something and how it actually made sense because we're talking different languages. And probably one of the most important one was are we actually able to test this in a reasonable time frame? So what is behavior-driven development? Well, behavior-driven development is really very similar to test-driven development. So test-driven development is really where, we're at the beginning of our development cycle, we're gonna sit and we're gonna write the unit tests and then we're gonna write the code afterwards. That way we can validate what the end result is. Behavior-driven development really is, we're gonna write the results of what we want first and then we're gonna write afterwards. So how we do that is we're actually using a parser called Gherkin so that we can start talking in a middle language. Like for example, uh, we can actually start writing our unit tests in English. So, and then let Gherkin process that and then create the, those connections behind the scenes. Now we can actually start writing our unit tests as actual examples of how we want the data to be processed. The nice thing about this is it creates a more agile workflow because now we're actually able to start doing living documentation, that every time we update the code, we're also updating the examples to match, so we're always up to date. 
We also are able to, which I feel is the most important aspect of this development process, is start enabling team members to start, in it, to start participating in the development process. These are the team members that are part of our team that normally aren't able to interact because they're not developers, but they are the people who have a lot of information. What we saw as a big benefit for Apache Spark was really to start tackling our core problems of, of data transformation. Um, typically, your data transformation pipelines are very batch oriented. We go and we run the data all together, and then at the end, in order to prove that everything worked, we'll query it together. We'll do some sort of query at the end just to validate the test results were. One of the coolest things that we saw about Apache Spark when we started using it was, hey, we could just give it, we could give it the, to the input, and the output came out almost instantaneously. And so we're able to change this aspect of how we're interacting with data transformation to be from a batch-oriented to streaming. And in fact, we liked Spark so much, it became our favorite hammer. We like to use it for everything. So one of the things that we like to talk about is how did we actually implement this framework? How do we actually put this into place, not just, taught, not just have it high level? And that was actually the Cucumber project, which allowed us to actually integrate it into the JVM. And to give an example about this, Zach here will actually start working us through an a example, a code example. Absolutely, and so this is where we get to get into the fun stuff. So um, for this presentation, I was given this uh, scenario. You see the first thing is we get data coming in in Unix time. Next thing is we have the data in Unix time, and humans can't read that, and so we need it to be human-readable time, and so we have to convert that. And the third one is that we get different developers running the queries. So we have analysts in San Francisco and New York and Boston and everywhere else, and we want them to see the time in their local time zone so that they can understand how the data is coming in. So first things first, you got to set up your main class. And in there, you set up your Spark session. And in Databricks, it's easy. You just get or create the session, and it magically does all the setting up of the cluster, assuming you have one. And then from there, I create an extraction class, and I pass in the Spark session. And assuming the variables are all good, I get three different parameters. The first one is the source path. Second one is destination path. And the third one is the time zone offset of the data analyst running the query. So now that we're hopping into the code, the first thing that you have to do is you get the JSON data frame. In our case, we usually get it from S3. Um, so you get the JSON. The next step is to extract it. And the final step in an ETL process is usually saving it back either to S3 or back towards the uh, Redshift or wherever else you're going to. So taking a little bit deeper, deeper dive into the extraction code, um, we're taking the time zone offset that was passed in, and we create a new column with that. We convert the Unix timestamp that was passed in into a timestamp in GMT time. And then finally, we take the time zone offset and we convert that to the local time zone of the person running the query. And we format it using the timestamp format at the top. Additionally, I created this other method called get extracted JSON data frame, which we'll use later for the uh, notebook experience in here. So in a typical um, data warehouse testing environment, you might run a query like this. You could pack your unit test around it or however you want to do it. But the basic idea is you select all rows where the time zone offset isn't zero. And then you look at your select query. You make sure that the time zone offset is equal to the difference in time between the GMT and the LTZ time. And you look through all 10 rows, make sure that it looks about right. And then that's how you do a nice manual validation test. The brave new world of Cucumber and BDD, or Behavior Driven Development, we're able to write the tests such that it looks like English text. And so here, the first, the very top row, you can see a couple different tags for the test. Line two has the feature name. So this one is called JSON Logs Extract Process Version 1. And so this is kind of the name of the class or the name of the group of tests that you're running in this file. Um, from there, you can go into your background steps. This background 
Um, we run all the tests in UTC time. Again, this is because we have developers running all the tests in all different time zones. And so if I run the test and I assert that the output time zone, the output is going to be a certain time and somebody else runs it in Boston, you're going to get a difference of three hours, so the unit test will fail. And that's no good. So jumping into the actual test itself, uh, we name the scenario basic extraction of Unix time into readable local time zones specified by the person doing the extraction. And so here, the first step, um, in unit testing, you generally have this thing called arrange act assert. And so this first given statement is where you arrange all of the preconditions or data that you need to test with. And so in this case, we have a file. And this file has two lines in it. And each line has those three different properties in JSON format. Um, from there, you have a when statement, which is your action, or assert, or act. And so we have our source destination folder and the time zone offset that's specified by the user running the port report. Finally, we get to assert that we have a success file and that the output is in the US specific time that we specified on the input. And then in the Databricks notebook environment, I also ran a quick little query and it looks like that. It's a little bit, it's not quite a normal distribution curve. And so I looked in and I looked, there were actually two different peaks in it because you see the US Eastern and US uh, so Pacific. I have, yeah. I have questions. Yeah, what's up? All right, so I'm, I'm looking like here. And so are you telling me like when we use our mobile financial app that people are using it mostly around, what is this, like 5 a.m., 7 a.m.? Is yeah, that, I was that, a bit confused by that too. Why and then, why and like people on the Pacific like Coast are doing this. Yeah. And then, like on your other example, it like because I know I normally use my I usually screw around with my phone like around mm -hmm. noon time, not like in the morning. Yep. I'm too busy for that. Um, that doesn't look right. Yeah, I was. I was. I, in mm -hmm. fact, I think the thing that I see here is you're saying that this is going to be readable in the local time zone specified by the person doing the extraction. Yeah. And so I, in, in a mobile client situation, I'm thinking that it's based off of when the person's actually using the mobile client in their time zone. Oh, no. Well, it's a good thing this is a demo, and we happen to have the next version or iteration of this ready to go. And so here you can see. We have a new version, and in this scenario, this is the basic extraction of Unix time into readable local time zones of the devices doing the action. And so here you can see it's the same thing, but here we're not passing in the time zone of the user running the query. And then also the two different time zones that are passed in here, we get Pacific for log ID 1 and Eastern for log ID 2. We can see down in the results we get those same two time zones as the output. Is this more what you were looking for? Do you have a graph? I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and so as you can see now, it's a nice, even, right. normal distribution. So that, I think that looks a little bit more normal, right? OK, so that looks a little bit more normal, people doing stuff about that. Yeah. OK, that's awesome. Thanks. All right. So that was a little example just to show you what it could be like the, the interaction, right, between your communication. And that's actually what we want to actually do when we do the process. We want to actually create a collaboration or participatory process by which we're able to actually talk about it. One of the biggest problems in development is usually the low communication between the domain experts, the people who really know the business, and the development staff. And this is actually one way, if you look at this, that you can actually just be able to pass off the, some of the work to the domain experts and say, please, go type your scenario for us so that we can start understanding it. And then create that communication back and forth about how things are supposed to actually be working. Now, another advantage of actually going with, the, with behavior driven development around is that when you start thinking naturally, you start thinking about better, situa about better scenarios. When you're thinking in code, you sometimes get a little code think. But when you start thinking normally, as in everyday expressions, you may actually come up with more scenarios. So I like to use the scenario of like, when it is summer, I might want to go ice cream, have ice cream. When it's winter, I might want to have hot chocolate. And you can keep on riffing off of that because you're talking about it as a real thing, and then you're communicating it back into a real thing. And so you can start writing your scenarios 
in that format, and then you come back and fill it in. Usually we forget some of our normal scenarios until we actually hit production and hit a bug. So this is just one way to help you kind of process this in a very natural way. Another advantage of using the Cucumber framework is we're also able to start unifying our use cases. So in our case, we're using ETL as a use case. But we can also take other use cases because we're focused in on what the result is. So for example, we can say, how about machine learning? The, pe the people who are using the result of the, product, uh, of the product are probably more concerned with how the product actually returns the result. They're not really concerned, for example, what the parameters, what the machine learning model is, what actual code that you're using actually to get that result. And actually that allows you, to, it actually enables you because you fill in these scenarios and the results and then you can go and improve the code underneath it and then fill it in afterwards. You can also, we also realized when we started working with Apache Spark, Apache Spark is just one pro product in the entire ecosystem that we're using. And so we're able to say, let's go create a standard way of testing across the system that everyone can understand and then we extend it across. So you'll notice when we actually did this example, we showed you what was called a feature file. And that's a feature file is really our file that allows us to actually create our expressive scenario, to say what's actually going to be occurring in there. And the given when then statements, they're, they're there to help standardize readability. They're not there to enforce exactly how you're supposed to be writing. It just creates standardization. So if you were to give this to a group of people and said, hey, go write some unit testing, here are some basic rules, these are basically the basic rules that allow you to come up with something that's going to be somewhat representative and, wor and works together. But if you guys thought, okay, awesome, we can process English, create these unit code, uh, create the code, everything, there's actually a little bit more. So this feature file, and we did this on purpose, we just showed the feature file at the beginning because it's just really saying, hey, this is what we want you to go do. We still have to go write a little bit of code behind there to actually link things together, and that's going to be the step definition file. That's actually going to be, as I put it up here, the boundary of where the programmer and the, and the main start be, being able to meet. And for this example, we'll bring Zach back to show. Yep. And this being an more. intermediate level course, I'm going to jump right into the IntelliJ. So you can see here, I have a completely fresh, almost fresh, I have a new two new folders, but I have a completely fresh IDE with a fresh Cucumber project. The first thing you need to do is import your, uh, let's go, there we go. The first thing you need to do is import your uh, Cucumber core, Cucumber JUnit, and Cucumber Java dependencies. Uh, using Maven, it's really straightforward. If you're writing in Scala, you can also just use SBT. It has the same references. Uh, the next thing you need to do is create a feature file. So we'll just call it spark.feature. And in there, we can paste our first feature. So this is similar to the one that we were reviewing before. Um, here we can just run the scenario as we're talking. But what happens here? Um, as I described before, you have your feature, and here we try running the scenario. And oh no, look, the test failed. But as Aaron mentioned, you actually have to write your code behind this feature file in order for it to actually run the test. And so here we see it says you can implement the missing steps by the snippet below. So we're going to copy and paste that snippet. Or in IntelliJ, you can uh, wait for the little light bulb and create a step definition. Here we're going to use Java. and. Uh, we want to put it in the same package as the feature file, so we're going to com slash cucumbers. All right. And here, it already generated the code for us, but we're going to copy and paste. Uh, we'll just use the limits there. And going back to our demo sheet, I just happen to know exactly what needs to be put there. And here, we paste that in, and we auto add the time zone dependency. And here you can also run it by right clicking on your feature files over here. This is a plugin into IntelliJ. And you can see now, lucky for me, this demo passed. And now we're able to run the test in the first scenario passed, even though it's not really doing much yet. But you can see it's got its one step. Good news. 
all right, so rather than sitting here for the next two hours coding out the entire thing, I happen to have the entire solution coded out, ready to show. And so here we have our feature file, um, like before, but now we can use Apple click or control click into each step definition. Um, the first one is slightly different in that we have a list of strings here. And so we can step into this definition and you see the um, definition of this method or the signature of this method. Now we have a list of strings and now we can iterate through that list and save it into a file which will be later used by the actual code that I showed earlier to read that into memory. You could also um, more performantly rather than writing it to disk you could just go into a JSON string but for this demo we're going the most straightforward possible way. Um, another nice thing is you can use ResX and so you have one of two different choices and in the um, feature file itself it highlights which one of those it is to make sure that it actually shows. And so if I tried going to V3 that isn't an option and so you can see it doesn't auto complete and it will ask me to implement that step of definition. So we'll revert that again. Um, uh, the third, this then statement is fairly straightforward, but then this last one has a full table with rows and columns. And so here um, you can see we actually pass in a list of maps called the data table. And so this we're able to loop through and have an error loop looping through and you can validate that they're the same. There's also other ways to validate that the data frame matches up with the table passed in. Um, but for the simplicity of this, this is the most straightforward way that I did it. Um, another important thing that you specifically need to do for Spark is before and after hooks, which is similar to when you're writing normal unit tests where um, you need to do your things before the test. And so in this case, we're setting up a Spark cluster and uh, running it locally and or calling an existing cluster and then running all the tests using that same cluster from that point forward. And yeah, back to you, Aaron. All right. So always when you go in through the learning experience, you remember it a different way, whether or not it's hard or, or, or easy. In my case, I always remember myself going through this as Clint Eastwood and Jack as the other guy. So you'll notice that we use the clips and an IDEA and IntelliJ quite a bit up here, and that's really because we have an enterprise use case, being from FIS Global. We have to do probably what a lot of, uh, what a lot of maybe you guys actually have to do as well, where you actually have to show separation of duties and on a trail, you know, I'm moving the code from here to production and so forth. And that doesn't mean that we don't actually love the notebooks. In fact, our next example is going to show you how to integrate this process with, in with the notebooks. Just one a couple of things that I wanted to say about it, which is most of our data processing tasks really should have some sort of testing framework over it. And that's mostly because almost every single business, almost every, has some sort of their own custom business rules and transformation that they've learned to implement over time. And so this allows us to wrap the unit tests around it and then consolidate that and allow QA to check it so it can be reused by the notebook environment. And that actually then lends to the fact that we're able to enforce consistency and correctness. So with that, I'll let Zach show us a little quick demo about how we're able to integrate those together. Yeah, jumping right into the notebook environment, or before that, I already have a cluster going and I already uploaded that jar that I created in IntelliJ up to it and I've attached that to the cluster called demo cluster. From there, I then open up my notebook and the first thing you need to do is import the class. Um, that was the class and the pack, you have to import the class using the package. And then from there, I um, still have version one and version two to show the difference. And so I set my time zone to Pacific and then I use Databricks DBFS to pick the log file that I want. And authentication is already set up for that. And so here's a sample of the data and what it looks like. And then from there, I can just continue to use Spark SQL to run the rest of the queries. And here you can see the three different tables that I used, or the three different charts that I used earlier on 
for the presentation. Uh, continuing on, we have, uh, there's a couple different ways. So not everybody is a developer. Not everybody uses IntelliJ. And so, for instance, Aaron's a director. And so he may not have access to GitHub or whatever else I'm using. And so you need a way to display that to him. And so Cucumber, which is Java-based, has this built-in one right here, which honestly I feel like looks kind of ugly. And so using the, here there's this plugin, pretty HTML target Cucumber. This is what it looks like. But Lucky for us, there's actually this other one called, um, yeah, Cucumber Report. And here it has a nice, pretty report that shows you your passing and failing tests. You can go by tag, steps. It shows you failures over time. And it works nicely. You can show that to all your different um, executives, and it shows a nice report so that then you can interact with all your different stakeholders, whether it's a tester or a director or an executive or your product owner. All right, next one. Uh, one thing that I noticed, if you happen to be a developer, you might have noticed this, that all of the step definition code was written in Java and not in Scala. And all of my extraction classes were written in Scala. This is because I really enjoy Scala and it works great with Spark, but the IDE integration with Scala and Cucumber isn't the best. Um, one example of that, here I'm able to right click and run scenario. You're not able to do that if your under the hood implementation is with Scala. And that's just because open source for Scala isn't quite as supported as it is for Java. And yeah, hopefully more people will contribute over time. Next one. Um, you might have noticed this line that I highlighted before. This is, if you're running tests over and over, you really want to have your Spark cluster up and running in the background locally, and then connect to it using your config in your test file. Because otherwise, you have a five, five to 10 second hit every single time you run your local unit tests. And to that, this third point is that if you notice, they weren't necessarily unit tests, and they were more mini integration tests of sort, because it's really, I mean, if you're testing individual functions, it might be easier to write unit tests, but with the way that the DAG works, you really need to test that Spark is running correctly all the way through all of its paths. And so you can test the input and output, and you kind of treat, the way that I do it is treat Spark as kind of a black box. And so there's certain individual things that I test other ways, but this is um, the way that I've been testing quite a few things. And so this is where, um, you can test all the things, but over time, like, our test suite has gotten up to 10 minutes, and I've trimmed it down and then shrank down different ways in testing things and testing things in the way that you want to. So put a lot of time into how you want to test things. Yeah. Last but not least, you can also get code coverage. If you're going to use Scala, you also have to turn on tracing and com. But, yeah. All right, so we put a whole bunch of the resources that we found with Cucumber right here on this slide so that uh, as you get access to the slides, you'll be able to just hyperlink and find one, one we'd like to call out at the end is specification by example. It's a very nice book that actually talks about how to implement behavior-driven design and the different scenarios as the author actually works through them. We also put a shameless plug at the end to the Databricks blog where we actually concisely went over the same material just a little bit more directly. Thank you very much for your guys' time. We're glad that you came. If there's any questions. Thank you, guys. If you have any questions. Um, We're almost out of time. We've got about a couple of minutes. Uh, there's a mic at the end. And if you have questions on this side, I'll run in. You can use my mic. I know it's the end of the day. If not, then please give a big hand to Aaron. And thank you. Exactly.